Thanks, Dr. Bond. It's great. Um, all right, so our final TED speaker today uh, really needs no introduction to this audience. This is uh, Dr. Stan Gerson, uh, as you all know, a renowned physician and cancer researcher and the immediate past director of our cancer center, handing the reins to Dr. Schwartz. Dr. Gerson now serves as the dean of the Case Western Reserve School of Medicine, as well as the vice president for medical affairs. Some of you may not know that Dr. Gerson graduated from Harvard College, did thesis research during that time at MIT. He got his MD from Harvard as well before doing his residency and fellowship in hematology oncology at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Dr. Gerson came here to become the uh, a member of the Cancer Center as well as eventually the Division Chief of Hematology Oncology um, and one of the Associate Cancer Center Directors uh, back in um, in the 90s and and since that time uh, Dr. Gerson as you all know uh, rose to the level of Director of the Cancer Center where he successfully renewed our uh, NCI designation in 2004, 2007, 2012, 2017, with exceptional status designation. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Gerson has had a very distinguished scientific career. He served and chaired, new, served on and chaired numerous NIH study sections, and he's been on the National Cancer Institute Board of Scientific Advisors. Published more than 275 articles, 37 book chapters, 19 patents. A number of his inventions have gone on to be um, tested in clinical trials. Uh, really a remarkable legacy. So it's my honor today to introduce uh, Dr. Gerson for our final TED Talk. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gerson to the stage. Um, so I want to first uh, thank the uh, organizers for mistakenly thinking I can give a good TED Talk, but we'll give it a go. Um, and also for uh, Meredith and Jake for uh, uh, setting up the conversation. So the good news is everybody has asked me, what does it mean? Don't get stuck. So here's the genesis of this. So every once in a while, I wake up in the middle of the night with an incredibly cold sweat and a pounding chest with images that I'm stuck inside a small capsule. And then I got in there by some windy path, maybe a closed door I couldn't open, and it's really scary. And this is for real. And I try to figure out as I'm waking up how to get out of this thing, and I can't do it. And I realize I'm stuck, and I don't know what to do. And so as I orient myself, I say, well, I guess this is the dream I've had a number of times before, and that helps uh, calm that adrenaline down. I've probably had it uh, um, 100 times over the last 30 plus years. And it's always a little different. Sometimes it's in the capsule through space, sometimes it's deep in the ocean like the submarine that just got lost. Sometimes it's in a cave like the um, Thai scouts getting stuck in that uh, water filling up cage. Every single time it's the same concept. I wake up sweating, pounding chest, and I can't get out. So um, it's pretty scary. So I think I can get this to work. You can imagine that um, I get a little PS PTSD every once in a while, and this is a picture of, that I took of my son on the top of the Saturn V uh, launch pad, reminded me of being in an Apollo capsule uh, when my son worked at SpaceX. Um, and I've had other examples of it. So when Amar Desai said, what do you want to talk about? I think he remembers that I got back to him in like 30 seconds, and I said, okay, how about don't get stuck? And he said, I don't know what you mean, but sounds good to me, so <laughs> here we go. So the reason I want to talk about this is we all get stuck, and we heard little hints of it from Meredith and Jake about that as well. And in our daily lives, it may be a paper we can't finish, a grant experiment we can't get done, the specific aim page that none of us write well enough, 
an experiment that's not working, challenges we have with a colleague who drives us crazy, maybe a microaggression, maybe a power struggle, maybe a challenge setting priorities, getting home for dinner, all that sort of stuff, unsolvable frustrations. So, you know, as I moved away from being a cancer center director, let alone how many times did I hear other people's being stuck, you can just imagine what it's like being a dean all day long, you get to hear about people who come into your office stuck. So let's talk about it. So when Laura Hamill, uh, who was our spectacular communications expert for the Cancer Center, interviewed me for the annual report, she asked me a whole bunch of questions and then she consulted down a little report and, and she began the, sesh, the, um, the introduction by saying, <laughs> I'll quote it, as a flute playing, kitten loving, avid hiker, and puzzle expert prepares to don the single hat as dean. Now there's a lot in there that's sort of fun to talk about, about flute playing and cats, but what in the world does, does it mean by puzzle? Let me tell you, I do not do printed puzzles, and I do not do crossword puzzles. I just worry about these sorts of puzzles. So now when people ask me what it's like being a dean, I say, well, I wake up in the morning with a series of puzzles, spend the day solving the puzzles, go to sleep, and wake up the next morning and do it again. And that's my day. So it never gets boring. It's always a learning experience. The experience is always something new to learn and do and think about. But what I'm really happening, what's really happening all day long is I'm saying, okay, don't get stuck on this one. And it keeps me out of trouble all day long. So I've incorporated it pretty deep <laughs> into my mindset, uh, people who know me, can sort of imagine that that makes all sense. Um, so how do you do it? Well, you got to turn that problem into a puzzle, break down the puzzle into components, uh, and then be as innovative as you possibly can. Find the solution, the insight, the work around the loophole, whatever it takes, and you all can do that as well. So <clears throat> the puzzle concept to me is really helpful because sometimes you can't get the whole thing done at once. You got to get a piece in a part and get pieces to fit together and you see how it starts to solve itself. Um, so I, as I said, I really like the idea of thinking of it a, of not being stuck. And there are other clues that I use. Uh, when I see somebody coming in and complaining about this doesn't work and this doesn't work and this doesn't work, I say, well, you're in a vicious cycle. How about if we ver reverse it to a virtual cycle so that when you make one success, you can get the next success in the next one? How do you turn the impossible into the necessary? And how do you find a way to make your own little problem uh, disappear and go away? Now, I thought I was the only person who ever figured this out. And so, uh, as Meredith, uh, we were up hiking. This is in the French Maritime Alps. How do you like that? This is in June, uh, about six weeks ago. Um, and we're up around 8,800 feet. And I was there with my uh, son and uh, spouse. And I started talking about don't get stuck. And we headed to the top of a cliff area with great views. But you'll notice I didn't take a picture of the views. It was pretty foggy up there. But I took a picture of the hole. So David says, you know, we're about six hours away from the last person we saw. What happens? if one of us cracks an ankle or twists an ankle or breaks an ankle falling into one of those cracks, which you can see there. It's bigger than you think. So I said, well, um, we just better stop what we're doing and think about where we're putting our feet, um, go at the right pace, look before you move, make sure that rock is stable. As you saw, we were going through snow, and at that time of year, you have no idea what's under the snow. So you spend a lot of time poking with a pole and making sure you know what you're doing. So then David, who's my smart 32-year-old, smarter than maybe I should know, said, Dad, and we had a good time, so nobody got hurt. That's the good news. So David said, you know, I know all about that. Uh, when I was at Stanford, two of our professors, uh, Bill Burnett and um, uh, Dave Evans, teach a course, as you can imagine, at Stanford, called Designing Your Life. And they have a life design lab where they help students and colleagues and uh, commercial folks out in business get around the problems that they have. And in my mind, what they're really doing is teaching you how not to get stuck. 
That's what it's all about. And they had example after example after example in this book of people who came to them with problems that were unsurmountable, and they showed ways to sort of help people figure it out and get out, get out of trouble. So they had some cool ideas. To me, it all boiled down to being like an iRobot. When you hit a wall, turn, and you'll be OK. And often, you know, guess what? Success is right around the corner. You just have to turn, and you'll find it. So conventional thinking can often be a stranglehold. Setting your goals too high can be a, can be a disaster. Uh, not looking at your data can be a problem. And so they suggested being as creative as you could, no matter where your position was, disrupt your sequence of, of of hypotheses and, and th things you thought you knew, and don't trust any premise, start over. So let me tell you about John Donzi, whom the people at Case in the School of Medicine know is now our chief uh, um, uh, grants manager for the uh, School of Medicine. So in the 90s, John was in my laboratory where we did a lot of DNA repair uh, enzyme assays uh, for a gene called MGMT. And his job was to run the HPLC and isolate O6-methylguanine. Uh, that's the therapeutic agent of temozolomide, thank you very much, that Jake mentioned. And he showed up at a lab meeting one day and said, well, you know, for the last two weeks, these experiments haven't been working. He couldn't isolate the peak. We'd done 3,000 before, so there was something wrong. So we went through the problem list, as anybody would. We re-isolated the samples, bought new reagents, bought a new standard, changed the solvents, changed the column on the HPLC, spent a few thousand dollars in a few weeks, and nothing worked. So he showed me all this stuff in lab meeting. We made sure that everything had been changed and we just hadn't changed one at a time. And I said, uh, what about the water? And he said, well, it's double distilled water. We get it from the school. It's been perfect all these years. And I said, find another source of water and the problem went away. So don't trust the water. <laughs> Another example uh, comes from uh, Mark Rober. You know, you gotta be careful hiking with your 32-year-old kid because they get bored. And so one evening, we were coming down. No, we didn't camp out. Uh, and we're staying at a nice French Airbnb. He found this, uh, Mark Rober's uh, YouTube, um, that had just been posted of his graduation speech uh, a couple days before at MIT. Mark Rober is a NASA engineer, that's why my son happens to know him, and founder of Crunch Current Labs. And Mark is an out-of-the-box thinker, and he encouraged, as you can imagine, for MIT graduates, out-of-the-box out of expectations for what you do with your life. And he said, you know, first of all, don't look at small problems, look at big problems. And second of all, you're not going to get it right the first time. So embrace as naive optimism as you can. Take risks. He did say, which I thought was cool, make sure that rock you're about to step on is stable, because we remember that one. And he said, the second piece is remember your failures. Learn from them. Jake mentioned that as well. And the third was make sure you know your friends, your colleagues, and your partners as you move your program forward and keep that tight group of individuals with you for years at a time. You'll foster those relationships and make sure that they really advantage the program that you're developing. So he gave that serious talk and then you can see he flipped his graduation hat upside down, attached a, um, a uh, drone to it and flew it over the MIT uh, drone, um, dome, which any of you have been there, you know, it's about eight stories up. I don't know how he did it, but he did. So the third um, example of this, if you will, to verify the importance of it, is from Adam, Adam Atler, just published a book called Anatomy of Breakthrough. A breakthrough. He's got a much more personal assessment of the problems we all have, and he suggests that um, when we get stuck, we're often pretty lonely. We don't quite know where to go. We don't know quite how to get out. Um, and he said that some recurring ways to sort of have your checklist, he called them the friction list, was look at your heart, i.e., uh, think about how your emotional energy is going the wrong direction. Look at your head, 
Think about how your patterns and your assumptions may be not quite right. And then look at your habits, which are the result of the first two, because maybe the things you're doing repeatedly are getting in trouble for you on the way forward. And so he suggested, again, sort of a personal perspective, but some of you might find it useful, um, that you had to get out of your own way uh, to really be successful. So as I said, <laughs> I like to think about this as going from the problem to the puzzle and thinking about um, breaking it down in components. But in addition to our own work, we're often struggling outward, either with a group, a department, the cancer center, the school, the university, the C-suite at the Cleveland Clinic, which I hear a lot about, um, uh, hospital, hospital departments, finances, all the rest of that stuff. And so those are much more complex. So some examples we're dealing with here is how do we build the next spore? We've got one, how do we do the next one? How do we build a robust biorepository, make it functional? How do we build the next big center? I was just talking to someone about our artificial intelligence center for the School of Medicine. How to build that translational cancer research team that's MDs and PhDs when they're all preoccupied with what they all want to do. How do we sequence every single cancer patient and then know what to do with the data and do it cost effectively? And who in the world is going to help us revise that R grant or that P grant? Uh, let alone all the social things that we're dealing with. Uh, Alex and I get to deal with admissions now thanks to the SCOTUS decision. So here's some solutions and some suggestions about these big picture challenges. First of all, you got to remember and respect the fact that institutions care about themselves and not about us. That's their job. And they've got to manage their resources. And there isn't that much left over for you. So sounds like we're all stuck. What are we going to do? So first of all, flip it around. And remember that they're stuck. You're not stuck. Because they're stuck in their ways. They don't know how to get out of their own problem. And they don't have time for you because they're stuck. They've got preoccupations. They've got insurance companies. They've got federal rate agencies, they're stuck. So you need to come with them with a solution for them, not for you. So just flip it around. How do you help them do better at what they want to do? They've got 500 people coming at them. How do you make yours the most important one to respond to? So if you're creative, you can always gain traction and gain attention, help them solve their problem, and help them out. So if you walk in the dean's office, or the president's office, or the CEO's office, or the institute director's office, and say, do I have a deal for you? Here's how I'm going to help you get over a problem that you're having. They're going to listen. The next thing is, make sure when you ask for something, that you help them realize their return on investment, how it's going to help them, and how make them look better, whatever parameter you want. It doesn't have to be financial. Maybe a paper, maybe a grant maybe indirect cost recovery. If they see their light at the end of the tunnel, they're going to support you even more than you can imagine. And build the scheme. Now, I've had, just as an aside, uh, two people in my office the last two weeks. One said, I've got a $20 million need. It's going to cost you $200,000 for the next three years. I'll raise this. I'll get this. I'll get this. I'll get this. And by the way, at the end, after I've done all this, I'm going to need $2 million. Is that OK? How am I going to say no to that one? Versus somebody came, coming in and saying, I don't know what to do. It's going to cost me $6 million to get started. So you've got to make a decision. Okay? The other visual I really like is when you go into somebody's office asking for something, you put out your hand with a small gold coin. And you better make sure they want that small gold coin. Because you'll walk out with a much bigger one if they like the idea. So make sure you've got something that's very convincing to them. So other little items which are important is know your institution, know their strategic plan, know their personalities, know where they want to go, make sure you add to them, um, and make sure you're realistic about your deliverables and what you want to accomplish and how you want to get there. And listen to others so that you can you can help uh, them appre uh, appreciate both what you want and how to get there. And sometimes, here's my final visual, 
I think of myself as a gingerbread man. You just got to run faster and let them catch up with you rather than you having to catch up with them. So be realistic in your time frames. And when others zig, you better zag. So with these big picture principles, just remember to think of big ideas. Big ideas win, not small ones. Come at the puzzle, whatever it is, in a different direction and don't trust your, pre your preconceived notions. Break down the unknowns to reduce the risk. Take an iterative approach and you'll get to where you want to go. And know the value of the investment that you're asking for that you're going to make and that they're going to make as well. So I'll close by saying that I'm going to sleep better tonight because I've given this talk. And I'm going to help you solve your puzzles. Um, and by doing so, you'll help yourself, the cancer center, the school, hospitals, the university, and the like. So just remember, don't get stuck in sweet dreams. Thank you. Thank you.